Let's apply this to a circuit that we've already seen. This is an example from a previous lecture where we did an impedance match from 5,000 ohms to 50 ohms. And one possible way to do that, we found, for a frequency of 75 megahertz, was to arrange an inductor and a capacitor as shown here. At resonance, stored energy cycles between being completely in the inductor, completely in the capacitor, so we may analyze either one. Now this is a concept that hopefully you've encountered in a previous uh, course, probably your first electrical circuits course, but the idea here is that energy must be moving back and forth between the capacitor and the inductor and that's happening at resonance and when we have resonance we know that there will be some point in time when all the energy is in the inductor and another point in time when all the energy is in the capacitor. So from the perspective of analyzing the amount of energy it really doesn't matter whether we look at the inductor or the capacitor we know that we're talking about the same amount of energy. So let's do that. Q by analysis we just showed on the previous page is omega naught, that's 2 pi times the frequency of resonance, times energy stored, divided by power escaped, the power that manages to get, get out of the two port. Well, the stored energy is given by the expression magnitude I sub L squared times L. Now this is L, that's the value of the inductance. I sub L is the current through the inductor. And you should be familiar with this expression from, again, a previous course. The energy stored in the inductor is magnitude I sub L squared times inductance. Also, we know that the power that escapes must be given by I sub L magnitude squared times R sub L, where this is R sub L. You see this current I sub L is flowing through that load resistance R sub L and dissipated power is equal to the magnitude of I sub L squared times R sub L. Well look what happens here. Magnitude I sub L squared cancels with magnitude I sub L squared. That leaves us with omega naught L in the numerator and R sub L in the denominator. Well, you should recognize omega naught L as the reactance of that inductor. And R sub L, of course, is just R sub L. Now, why is that interesting? That's the exact same value that we got for this parameter Q in the previous lecture, where we invoked this idea. Q was defined as the square root of the ratio of the high and low impedances minus 1. Now, in that previous lecture, we invoked that idea purely for mathematical convenience, purely to get these simplified expressions. However, when you look at this expression here, that is exactly the same as what's going on here. I see that XSER is Q times the lower resistance, and that is the lower resistance. So the Q I have computed here is exactly the same as the Q I've computed here. Now I've done this for a special case. Uh, however, I'll tell you it's true in general. I'm just, I just think it's useful to see it done for a simple problem. And you can generalize this in all kinds of ways, but the basic idea is true, that this Q that we're talking about here, this very general concept, is in fact this Q that we introduced to simplify the equations when we have real-to-real -real matching. Now, taking advantage of that knowledge, we can say that this thing here is equal to this thing here, just relating those two concepts. That is, if we want an impedance match. So, profound implication here. The bandwidth of a real-to-real -real L match is inversely related to the square root of the ratio of the impedances. Let me say that again. Here's the ratio of the impedances that we try to match. And it turns out that that gives us a Q parameter, and Q is inversely proportional to bandwidth. So that's what I mean by the bandwidth of the real-to-real -real L match is inversely related to the square root of the ratio of the impedances, at least approximately, because we have this minus 1 here. Now, let's think about that. Does that really make sense? Well, here's an idea. 
what happens if r sub high divided by r sub low is 1? Now, you could say that's kind of a silly problem. Why would I try to do an impedance match when both the port impedances are the same? Well, let's just follow this through. If both the port impedances are the same, then r high equals r low. This thing here equals 1. Everything in the radical equals 0. So q is 0. But bandwidth is inversely proportional to q, so bandwidth is infinite. So if that ratio is 1, then we get bandwidth, which goes off to infinity. But that makes perfect sense. What that's saying is that if the impedances I'm trying to match are equal, the bandwidth of that match can be infinite. And that makes perfect sense because I can just connect the two ports together like so. Now, in what way specifically is this bandwidth that's based on Q, the quality factor, related to bandwidth that you're more familiar with? Let's look at this example uh, where we're matching 5,000 ohms to 50 ohms and we get this circuit. And I showed you this frequency response. Again, this is all from this previous lecture. So for this circuit here, it's this curve here. All right. And the TPG is 1, that is 0 dB at the design frequency, 75 megahertz, and all the frequencies is less than 1. So there is a 3 dB bandwidth here. Right? There's a 10 dB bandwidth here, and so on. There are many different bandwidths that we could define. Well, the 3 dB bandwidth here is 15.2 megahertz. That's what I measure. The Q is 9.95. So B sub Q, using the expression that I've derived already just a little bit earlier in this lecture, is 47.4 megahertz. So that's quite a bit larger than 15.2 megahertz. In fact, it's closer to the 10 dB bandwidth. So we see that B sub Q is not necessarily related to half power bandwidth. Now, I'll lay one other idea on you, and this is useful trivia. I'm not going to derive it, but you will see that it's true when we do other problems. Here's the idea. When Q is much, much greater than 2 pi, then the 3 dB bandwidth turns out to be approximately the Q bandwidth, that is B sub Q, divided by 2. Now in this problem, the Q is only 9.95, and 2 pi is only about 6. So this relationship is not really effective yet. But when Q is big, like 100, then you will see that B sub Q divided by 2 is about the 3 dB bandwidth. And that's a useful idea because that idea you can use to design impedance matching circuits for a particular bandwidth. So just keep that in mind. Not deriving it here, I'll just point out that's true. And in fact, you can verify that's true. You can go develop circuits that you know will have a very high Q, and then you can test this idea, and I think you'll find it's true. Okay, how to increase match bandwidth? Well, now we have seen that since bandwidth is inversely proportional to Q, obviously one way we can increase the bandwidth of an impedance match is to decrease Q. That means decreasing the ratio of energy stored to power escaping. So how can we go about doing that? One way we can do that is to increase dissipation. That will certainly accomplish it. Uh, the downside, of course, is that TPG will be degraded. Typically, we're talking about uh, introducing loss into the two-port. That will decrease the Q, but the TPG will also be degraded. Now, you might think that that might disqualify this idea immediately in all practical applications, but not true. Sometimes it's so hard to get the bandwidth that you need from an impedance match that you have no choice but to do this. And I'll tell you a very important class of examples where this happens is trying to impedance match antennas to transceivers in handheld phones. Now we may or may not have an opportunity to talk about that idea, but I'll tell you that this problem is so desperately hard that frequently the answer turns out to be to keep adding loss to the antenna or to the matching circuit uh, to the point where you can finally get the bandwidth that you need. 
pretty shocking idea if you're not used to it, but I will tell you that it is in fact very commonly done. Now alternative to that, assuming dissipation is not acceptable, is additional resonances. So the idea here is that for narrowband matching, what we did is we found one resonant frequency and we got a TPG of one at that frequency and we just let everything fall apart away from that frequency. But you could design impedance matching circuits in principle that had multiple resonances. So I call that omega one, omega two. And these could both be resonant frequencies in the sense that uh, the reactances cancel at those frequencies, at two frequencies instead of one. And then you would get a response that kind of looked like this, right? Where at two frequencies, you could achieve a TPG of one. And then in between, it would do something undesirable probably. It would have to be less because the TPG of a passive circuit is not greater than one. But um, uh, that's, that's a, a not crazy idea. So this is sometimes referred to as the circus tent strategy. The idea is that this kind of response looks like a circus tent where these are the uh, poles that are holding up uh, the high points in the tent. Uh, now this is not really recommended primarily because it gives you these very lousy response curves. Nevertheless, this occasionally has applications. Not very often, but sometimes. A far more effective way to do this, to increase the bandwidth of a match, is to use multiple L sections in cascade and to adjust the impedance a little bit at a time. So instead of going immediately from one impedance to another impedance, you might have more than one matching section and you gradually increase the impedance. And we will certainly investigate that idea. That's a topic of a future lecture. So I'll lay that idea on you now and we'll revisit in a future lecture. How would you decrease <clears throat> the match bandwidth? Well, you could increase Q. Again, bandwidth and Q are inversely related, so you could increase Q. That means increasing the ratio of energy stored to power escaping. How are you going to do that? Well, you could decrease dissipation, but that's only effective if there's a lot of loss in the first place. So if you have no loss to remove, this is a non-starter. You could, once again, introduce additional resonances. So this is revisiting the circus tent strategy, but now all the poles in the tent are at the same frequency. So instead of doing this to increase bandwidth, what you do is you put those poles very close to each other or at the same frequency, which makes the response tend to be more peaked at that frequency. Now that's not a horrible idea. In fact, again, it's commonly used. You can stack up resonant circuits in such a way that this response just keeps getting sharper and sharper with more and more circuits in cascade. But a better way to do it in most cases is again to use multiple L sections in cascade and adjust the impedance in stages. Again, very powerful idea, topic of a future lecture. So what we're going to see in this future lecture is that we can take multiple L sections, multiple L shaped sections, and arrange them to either increase the bandwidth or decrease the bandwidth. So here's a summary of this lecture. Energy storage and power transfer in two port matching circuits. That is the concept that we've explored here. If you understand those concepts in the context of two port theory and impedance matching theory, you will be much more effective in designing impedance matching circuits. So I strongly recommend that you at least make sure that you have a working understanding of those concepts. We talked about bandwidth definitions. Bandwidth, not fundamental idea. Uh, however, there is this parameter B sub Q, which is somewhat uh, closer related to fundamental properties of a circuit. It doesn't necessarily give you the 3 dB bandwidth or the 10 dB bandwidth but it does give you an idea of what the bandwidth is going to be if you can evaluate the Q. We talked about quality factor Q. We now know how that's related to bandwidth and we now know how that's related to this impedance matching parameter R high R low minus one that we uh, introduced in a previous lecture. And then we talked about schemes for increasing or decreasing bandwidth and 
we narrowed down on one of those schemes and we're going to pursue that in a future lecture. This concludes this lecture on bandwidth and queue.